What I'm going to do in this mini course is give you uh, not a full proof, but a, a good idea about uh, a project that uh, we completed with Michael Eisenman a few years ago. And I'm going to do it in, in four steps. There are four classes. Uh, by the way, it's not every Wednesday. It's today, tomorrow, and then again to, uh, Wednesday and uh, Thursday next week. So during this first class, I'm going to tell you it's going to be an introduction, basically. I'm going to try to motivate the problem from two sides, to try to show you two uh, sides of the story, and to try to end up with actually a statement at the end of the tour. So it's, it's going to be uh, pretty introductory. Um, during the, the second class, I'm going to tell you about a tool that is going to be really super important for the whole proof, the whole argument. And it's going to take us some time. So it's going to take us, I guess, a full lecture to actually explain what this tool is. It's called the random current representation. And I will give you a few of the basic uh, properties of it and uh, how you can use it. We will practice like that. Third lecture, so next Wednesday. There, we will start really to try to prove uh, the theorem. I will just do it under an assumption, a kind of regularity assumption of, uh, of uh, what we call the spin-spin correlations, because things are way cleaner when you make this assumption. And in fact, you expect uh, very strongly that uh, this is the, the standard behavior for your model. So under this assumption, we will get uh, the result completely. And depending on time, because usually <laughs> you plan something and you go three times slower, so depending on time, I will tell you a little bit how you can prove this assumption in dimension four. I mean, in, sorry, in dimension five and more. And in dimension four, I will explain to you how you can go around the fact that you don't know this assumption, or maybe uh, try to give you hints on how we could prove the assumption. But as for today, we don't know how to prove it. OK, so we start. With the beginning, so in kind of, kind of introduction slash motivation. And I should start by saying that the result I'm going to discuss, uh, by the way, if you have questions, please ask. I mean, it's not because it's recorded that. Uh, everybody will know that you had a question. Well, actually, everybody will know, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Um, yeah, so this, um, the, the, the project, I'm, uh, I mean, the result I'm going to describe, it's actually related to two kind of distinct uh, ways of looking at, uh, at statistical physics and mathematical physics. So it's dealing with, or it's useful from the point of view of constructive Euclidean field theory, and I will, in a minute, tell you what this is. It looks like a big word, and maybe it is. But uh, I will try to tell you what I mean by that. And uh, in some sense, the theorem I will prove is a no-go theorem from the point of view of this constructive Euclidean field theory program. So it's, it's a negative result. So if it was only for that, it would maybe be a little bit uh, disappointing. But actually, the result is also interesting from the point of view of statistical physics. So really, the study of stati statistical physics model at criticality. So today, I'm, I want to kind of tell you a little bit about these two sides, and at the end to tell you what the result is. That's really the goal from today. And we are going to start with this thing, with the constructive quantum field theory aspect of the result. So first thing, so a motivation. from constructive Euclidean field theory. So the goal of, of Euclidean field theory, or one of the goals, is actually not to construct Euclidean fields, but to construct quantum field theories. 
So you know that, I mean, physicists in their everyday life, they like to deal with quantum fields. It's a very, very powerful tool, but it's also a very ill-defined tool from the point of view of mathematics. It's not easy to make sense of uh, uh, what we mean by a quantum field series. But uh, the in the second half of the, the 20th century, Osterwalder and uh, Schrader prove that, um, in some sense, if you want to construct if you want to construct a quantum field theory, well, maybe actually you only need to construct a Euclidean one. Meaning, you want to construct a random distribution so really distribution in the mathematical sense, but a random one satisfying certain regularity assumption. So what does it say? It's some kind of a recipe to turn, I mean, I give you a probability measure on distributions, so a way to pick a random distribution. And this theorem by Osterwalder and Schrader tells you, okay, now I can cook from it a quantum field theory. It's uh, using what we call Vick rotation, and you can really think of something like you are trying to construct something on the line, a function on the line, and you uh, extend it in the complex plane to the purely imaginary uh, line, for instance. It's kind of a little bit uh, uh, how the thing is working. This regularity assumption, may maybe let me just skip them. I just mentioned them. You need, for instance, that what we call the Schwinger functions that I will uh, define later on. You want them to be analytic in each coordinate. You want them not to depend on exchanging the coordinates, things like that. I mean, you have uh, two other things. You want them to be symmetric under, actually, the, the symmetries of, of, the, of the space. So rotation symmetry, scale uh, symmetry, things like that, translation. And you want them to be reflection positive. That's the four assumptions. I just mentioned them, but it's not the core of the uh, of the class, so I'm not going to spend time describing them. But OK, this Osterwalder Schrader uh, result, it's quite useful because it tells you, OK, forget about quantum uh, field theory, quantum physics in general. Just try to construct random distribution. And if you manage to construct, hopefully, uh, uh, interesting enough random distribution, then you will get interesting enough quantum field theories. Okay. So, in general, these Euclidean, Euclidean field series, I mean, these random distributions, you want them to define them in a smart way. So you would like, for instance, so imagine phi is my random distribution. And you want that when you, you apply a function to this random distribution, I will tell you which type of functions you want to apply. You would like morally, so when I take the average, this is the average. Okay. So when I take the average of phi against a function f, I would like that it looks like 1 over some normalization. So for now, everything is going to be a little bit vague. And it's normal. I mean, the goal is going to be to turn this into something a little bit less vague later on. So for now, it's a little bit difficult to make sense of this. But I would like this average of, of uh, f against phi to look like the integral against f of phi of exponential minus a Hamiltonian times product d phi x. And here, where f, 
So the function I want to apply will all be of the following form. They will be, in fact, what we call averages of phi against a function. So they will look like tf of phi, which would be the integral of f of x. Let me put phi of x like Phi of x dx. So you want to average phi against a function f. So this is the typical functions you want to apply on, on f. And this, say, for every f, which is uh, smooth and compactly supported. So that tells you what f is here. And h of phi, well, I want this to be of the following form. I want this to be a quadratic form applied to phi plus a kind of potential part, which could be something. So what was the notation? Yeah, I did it like that. Oh, this is on RD, by the way. Something like potential of p of phi of x dx. And here again, you see, it, you, you open like a <laughs> new space, and you need always to, to realize so where this is true. And now I need to tell you what q and p is. So where? I'm going to have less and less space, but that's fine. So q is a quadratic form. And in fact, what we call a reflection, well, let's say a positive quadratic form. And actually, the one that you are interested in usually is you want q of phi phi to be something like the integral of gradient phi x squared dx. This is typically what you want. OK? So normally, if you are uh, a mathematician, at least you should really be panicking on several aspects here. There are several things that make zero sense, and uh, I'm going to come to that. And the second p, what is p? So p will just be a polynomial of, uh, like, an even polynomial. OK, at least this, this we don't have to open a new drawer there. So. OK. Yes? So f is the product of here? Or f, sorry? The large f here. The large f is, is a function I'm applying on phi. And I want it to be of this form, always an integral of phi against some function f, so which is smooth and compactly supported. Yeah, sorry? It's linear, In this case, it's linear, yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, you are right. Then what you could also do, OK, so that's a good point. That's maybe level 0. And what you could then do is also take, for instance, this type of observables. Like just uh, like that, it will allow you to get correlations between. Uh, and, and P contains also quadratic terms. Maybe. So yeah, P will uh, will in general contain uh, quadratic terms. Yeah. So P is really even polynomial, so sum of uh, a k uh, x to the two k. Okay. So here, normally, one is worried. For many reasons. First, here we take a product, an infinite product, right? Because we have, I mean, we are indexing phi by Rd everywhere. So distribution on Rd. So we have an infinite product. So even this thing is not that clear. But then you see that if phi is a distribution, so it's not even a function, still you want to be doing things like taking gradients of phi, for instance taking exponential of things expressed in terms of phi. So you have millions of problems happening when, you, when I'm just formally setting these type of things. OK? And the goal of Euclidean field theory is to still try to make sense of objects like that. OK? Just um, to, because it's a, this is something physicists will often look at, you can make things even worse. So you can, in some sense, if you look at tf 
1 of phi tfk of phi or let's say you yeah or maybe just let's let's take uh, let's rather do that so if you take moments of t yeah well, okay, what i did was smarter let's say product for i equal 1 to k of t f i of phi which is also an observable which like that is not linear so you take this thing and if you kind of brutally imagine that you can uh, exchange the integrals this is going to be expressed as a multiple integral on rd of f 1 of x1 f k of x k and if you are lucky enough you could expect here that you can express this thing at as, as this times s k of x1 x k dx1 dx k again this is there is no reason that you can really write things like that but usually you will hope that this is possible and this guy in some sense you interpret it as phi x1 phi xk right it's kind of like the pointwise correlation in your field and it's called a Schwinger function again why this exists in general when you take q or p in a not to be too trivial it's, it's not clear okay let's give examples so the simplest example you can imagine is to take p so i'm always just i mean i'm always going to think of this q okay you can you can i mean everything i'm saying you can generalize to uh, to other quadratic forms but let's let's really take always this one so first thing you can imagine is to take p of x which is just quadratic i mean of course you can also put a uh, constant but uh, you realize right i mean if i take a constant notice that it will not impact edge of phi and uh, therefore it's just something that boils down to changing the normalization okay so if i take something quadratic here i end up with what we call gaussian processes so we i mean phi will be a generalized Gaussian process and I will give you one example which is a continuum GFF when I will start to define things correctly okay and the problem of Gaussian processes is that when you look at the Schwinger functions and you look at s2n of x1 x2n there is a very easy way to express it in terms of two-point functions. For a Gaussian, a generalized Gaussian process, this thing is going to be the sum of a pi, which is a pairing of the x1, x2n, of product for i equal 1 to n of s2 of x pi 2i minus 1 x pi 2i. So you can express the two endpoint function in terms of the two point functions, the product of the two point function. It's called the Vic law or Vic formula. And this is problematic, or it's not problematic, uh, it depends what you want to do, but in Euclidean field theory, this is problematic because this um, Vic formula when you put it in the Ostervaldo Schrader machinery, it spits on the other side a quantum field theory which is called trivial. 
in the sense that it describes particles that do not interact, which from the point of physics is not interesting. So in some sense, what you want to avoid as much as possible is to construct random distribution that at the end are just Gaussian processes. You want to avoid that. OK? You want to avoid, but I mean, it's not completely obvious you can. But clearly, the first thing you would like to try is to just make this a little bit more complicated to get to level two. Meaning that you take p of x, which is a plus b x squared plus c x to the 4. Actually, let's put lambda, because that's a standard thing. So you add, I, I will remove the a, because again, I mean, it's irrelevant. So let's. So you put a force power. And when you put this force power, then things a priori get more interesting. You are not a Gaussian process anymore. By the way, the reason why you are a Gaussian process is that if you look at the edge of phi, you can really put the b x squared into the quadratic form, and then you really get a Gaussian integral. Okay? So as soon as you have a lambda x to the 4, this is not possible anymore. And a priori, you, you get something more interesting. And this is what people call the phi 4 field theory. OK, but notice that in both cases, right, even for example 1, the thing is not obviously defined. We still have this problem of this infinite product here. We still have the problem that we are looking at a distribution, but we are taking the integral of the gradient of this distribution squared. And even just everywhere, like when we do something like that, we need this to make sense, right? We are integrating on Rd, so we need that this f of x phi of x is integrable. So careful, and this is true even for example 1. So It's not clear how you make sense of these things. And again, to mention the, difficul the difficulties, you are taking gradient of a distribution. You are taking an infinite product of a Lebesgue measure. And this is not that nice. And more importantly, I mean, it's not clear that the integral are uh, just integrable, I mean finite. OK? So you need to do something. And the standard way of uh, going around this thing, these difficulties, is to basically like regularize, smooth your distribution. So we are going to regularize the distribution. So to make sense of those, So we proceed by regularization. And here I should say there are many different ways of proceeding. You can, for instance, proceed by smoothing out phi. You can, so, so it's what people refer to as a smearing of, of your distribution. You can do a cutoff, for instance, a cutoff in Fourier space. For me, as soon as I see Fourier in this context, I'm panicking a little bit. So this is not what we are going to do. What we are going to do here is that we are going to do cutoff in space. We are going to work on a lattice. Okay, So we are going to do, in this class, a lattice off. And I'm going to illustrate that 
with example one, and then we will see that uh, doing it with example two is, is, is more subtle and, and leads to things that are a little bit surprising. So the idea is that we are going to define phi on a lattice, on a finite piece of, the, of a lattice. So typically, this finite piece is going to be called lambda r a. Which is going to be just the box minus r, r to the d, intersected with a z d. So you look at a big box, imagine r is very big. A very big box, and you look at a very fine mesh size lattice on it. So this is huge, it's of size r. It's 2 R there. And this is tiny, the mesh size of your lattice is A. And you think of this as providing two cutoffs. You are going to define phi only on, uh, on the vertices of this. So when you want, for instance, to take the gradient of phi, what you will do is that you will replace that by the difference between phi at two neighboring vertices. So A is kind of a cutoff that allows you to make sense of gradients, of infinitesimal fluctuations of the thing. R, on the contrary, is to guarantee that you do not work with like infinite integrals or things like that. There, it's going to be just a sum on finitely many vertices. OK? So sometimes physicists is just to, to give you a buzzword. So A, they refer to it as the ultraviolet cutoff. So it's, it allows to cut, I mean, to, to, to solve the problem of tiny fluctuation, fluctuation at small scales. And R will be the infrared cutoff. So it's, it solves the large scale uh, problems. OK. so. For now, I didn't tell you much. I just told you I want to define phi x on a finite piece. So now, let me tell you what I mean by this thing in this context. I'm happy when people don't ask me questions on this side because this is not my, <laughs> my area of expertise. So I'm happy if I <laughs> managed to convince you that everything is flawless. Uh, OK, so again, we look with phi x. x now is indexed by this set. So h of phi. So actually, we are going to do something a little bit, I mean, in the, as a statistical physicist, I prefer to distinguish between the Q and, uh, and this part. So we are going to define, actually, the thing a little bit differently. So h of phi, the Hamiltonian, is going to be something of the following form. It's going to be sum for x and y. So now things are well defined. Of jxy phi x phi y, and I put a minus. OK, so this is, a, again, a quadratic form in the phi x. I don't put the phi x squared. You are going to see this. I'm going to put it in the second term. But this is really, a, I mean, a discrete version of the, the quadratic form. So now, what will be, how did I write this? What will be the average of f? against phi. Notice I use this curly phi for the discrete. OK. So it's going to be something that is indexed by the, the graph on which we look. And because it's going to be practical for me in the future, I'm also going to put a beta parameter. 
and it's going to be 1 over something I will define in a second times the integral. But this time, it's an integral that makes perfect sense because it's an integral, an integral on r to the lambda r of a of f of phi times exponential of minus beta edge of phi. So this is going to be what we mix our edge of phi upstairs. And now I'm going to have a product, this time a finite product. And here, I'm going to put a measure rho on, uh, on phi. So rho is a measure measure on rd, uh, on r, sorry. And d rho of phi, typically, I want it, if I take one of this example, I want it to be, or oh, oh, actually, even in the generic way, I want it to be the integral. Uh, sorry, what am I doing? E to the minus P of Y dy. OK? So think in our two examples, for instance, I would like that. So in example one, it will typically be a Gaussian measure, something like that. And in example two, It's a slightly more weird thing. So here, maybe I should have said, I don't know how I did put it. Maybe there are minuses in the wrong direction. But okay. Something like that. OK? So you agree these are measures if lambda is positive. I mean, here, if lambda is positive, or here if b is positive, these are finite measures. On r, I'm doing a product of finitely many of those. This makes perfect sense. Here, this is a quantity which is well defined. I take this exponential, and I integrate against f. That makes perfect sense. OK, so what's the game? Uh, but, uh, yeah. So what's the game? The game is that we want to be doing things in the continuum. We want to be making sense of those guys. So what do we need to do? We need to let r go to infinity. We need to remove the uh, infrared cutoff. And we need to remove the ultraviolet one. So we need to let a go to 0. So can one let r go to infinity? and a to 0. Of course, we have a little bit of leverage. So this is the rule of the game. We need to do that. But we have cards in our hands. So what are the cards? Well. We are allowed to vary beta. And let's say if we are in one of these examples, we are allowed to vary lambda and b when we let a and r go to infinity, I mean r go to infinity and a to 0. So b beta, b, and lambda can vary. And I'm even going to add something, is that I could also scale phi. So I'm also allowed to rescale and maybe rescale phi by a factor epsilon. So the game, now if it's stated like that, is that I want to let a go to 0 and r go to infinity. And what I'm allowed to do is to move beta, b, and lambda in a sufficiently good way, and maybe to rescale phi also in a good way. And can I construct something non-trivial out of this? Can I construct a random distribution? 
First, can I construct these generalized Gaussian processes? And second, can I do something more interesting with FIFO? OK. OK. Just here, I wanted to do it in a general uh, generalized, uh, I mean, in, in a general context. But let, let's actually not complicate our life too much for the purpose of uh, this class. So JXY. I'm going to set it to be 1 if uh, x is a neighbor of y. So this is a way to say uh, x and y neighbors. And 0 otherwise. I could actually imagine a different set of, of jxy. First, like more complicated finite range things, maybe, you know, something that depends on the box of size 100 around you. You could also take JXY, which is something decaying polynomially. This is actually something more relevant. But the story is going to be simpler than the JXY, which is nearest neighbor for us. In our story, the nearest neighbor case, this JXY equal 1, is actually the worst one. So we are going to stick with this one. It's already sufficiently <laughs> interesting in some sense. OK. Very well. So I think maybe I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about this game in the case of example one. OK? Just like that, we have one clear example where things are actually working fairly well. OK. So back to example one. So game for example one. And here, maybe the probabilist would not be that surprised, because this is something we know fairly well. But still, let me redo it. So in example one, it's like lambda equals 0. The beta is actually not so important. So let me set it to be 1 over d. Actually, maybe I want 2D. Uh, there is zero chance I'm going to get the constant right. But I mean, there is a way to get the constant right. It's ju just not through me. Uh, and um, so there is just this parameter B that is the interesting parameter. And for now, let's imagine I want to write it 1 plus M. It's just another way of writing B. Hmm? OK, so I am uh, on lambda RA. And I'm going to define f of phi. Let me recall. Actually, yeah, yeah. Let me recall the parameter a and r here. So this, if I look at the formula, it gives me 1 over z. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you what z was. So z is a normalization that guarantees that the average here gives you a probability measure. That the dual of this average is the probability measure. So what is it? It's just what you get here for f equal 1. Okay? So it's just the integral over r to the lambda r a of exponential minus beta h times this. Just the normalization that you want to be uh, taking. So here you have again the normalization. Again, this quantity. And here, I just want to write my, uh, my beta h in a different way. Here, it's going to be minus 1 over 2d, sum for x neighbor of y, phi a r x minus phi y a r squared minus m phi x squared. This is just a way, when I have these parameters, to rewrite what was upstairs. OK, why is it good? Because here, you recognize a Gaussian integral. 
And this whole sum here, you could also write it as sum of x of phi x a r times Laplacian m phi x a r, where this Laplacian is a massive Laplacian, meaning that you get 1 over 2d sum for y neighboring x of j of y minus 1 plus m, I mean this whole thing, sorry, g of x. I'm just doing this, I mean trust me, I'm just doing like simple manipulations around the definition there to rewrite it in a slightly different way because when I write it like that, I immediately get that you are a Gaussian process with covariance given by the inverse of the massive Laplacian, which is the green function, the massive green function. So when you do that, for instance, and here there is a perfectly well notion of Schwinger function. And maybe, okay, so you are Gaussian, so I'm going to stick to just two terms. So x So if I look at the correlation like that for this measure, oh by the way, this is still on like that. This thing, because of this Gaussian structure, is just a massive green function between x and y. And here I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to tell you what this is. So the GM discrete is just the inverse of Laplace and M. So it's a function which, when I look at x dot, when I look at it as a function of the second coordinate, Laplace and M is 0 if y is not equal to x and is minus 1 if y equal x. Again, I think that there is no chance I'm actually putting maybe one, let's put it one. <laughs> there are too many signs in math. Um, okay? So why did I write that? I mean, why write the thing like that? It's because this massive green function, even in the discrete, they are actually quite easy to study and you can get the asymptotic behavior of those things. So first thing, so first thing is that one can let r go to infinity as soon as d is larger than 2. So in dimension 3 and in particular in dimension 4. Oh, by the way, I didn't say uh, something that uh, uh, I should have said immediately. Uh, in, uh, in this approach to constructive, I mean, this perspective on constructive Euclidean field theory, if you want to be related to quantum field theory, the natural dimension is dimension 4. Because you have three space and one time dimension. So we are not going to bother about what happens in dimension 2, for instance even three, even if it's very interesting, we are going to always think of dimension four, okay? So in dimension four, letting r go to infinity here is like, doesn't cost anything. You can let the, um, the infrared cutoff go to infinity. Now, the second thing which is interesting, so if I look at my lattice like that, so by the way, for the probabilists, actually for everybody, um, GM discrete can be seen as follows. You have a random walker on your graph that starts from x, and it's the number of times it will visit y, but this random walker at every step has a probability, I mean, has a, uh, dies with a rate m. Okay, so if you let a go to zero, then if the distance between the two points gets farther and farther away, because you die at a certain rate, if this rate is too big, then you are going to decay very fast. So here it becomes clear that you want to be rescaling the rate with A. 
And typically, what we are going to do is that we are going to take m to be of order a squared times uh, m star. So I will not change m star anymore. But as a tends to 0, I rescale m. OK? And when you do that, then what you can see is that a to the d minus 2 times g, uh, a to the 2 minus d, sorry, times g m uh, discrete x y, this is going to converge as a tends to 0. So now we are really on a times zd, OK? But you can take this limit. And you converge to the continuum massive green function, which is a solution of the same thing where you replace the discrete Laplacian by the continuum one. So same definition with discrete Laplacian replaced by continuum one. OK. Very good. So if you do that, then you realize that you exactly did the game we wanted to play. You took the two-point function, so it's a Schwinger version of it. You take the two-point function. And if you rescale m and the field phi, then you end up with what you want. So. If you do so m equal a square m star and you look at a, so you want to be rescaling by a to the 2 minus d times uh, over 2 times phi x, then the Schwinger function, let's call them maybe like that, s2a. So this was even s2ar of xy. A to A, I remove the R already of x, y, converges to an object in the limit, which in this case is very explicit. It's just this massive uh, this massive uh, Green function. OK. So this is for the Schwinger state. That's one way of seeing that you can make things converge. The other way is that you could directly look at the average against a function. So you can also take Tf of phi a. And here, well, you can exactly Try to look, I mean, how can you, oh, sorry, sorry. How can you look at the convergence of an object like that? You could look at the characteristic function. So I look at this average and I see whether that converges. This is a random variable. And a way to look how it converges in low is to look at the characteristic uh, function of this random variable. And if you look at this thing in this context, so I'm going to do it completely. So this is sum from n equals 0 to infinity of z to the n, n factorial times tf phi a to the n. OK? I just expanded. Here, if I remember the formula in terms of Schwinger uh, functions and the Wick formula, it's very easy to see that this is going to give you, in fact, Tf of phi a squared to the n times the number of ways you can pair uh, two n points, meaning two n factorial, I mean, yeah, two n factorial over uh, 2 to the n, n factorial. OK? OK. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I forgot this is for, I, I was thinking. I don't understand what is happening. 
uh, it's easy to see that the average is zero if n is odd. So let's uh, fix it to be even. So and, and this thing with 2n is exactly this thing. So when you write it like that, what do you end up with in the case of, of, uh, of our thing? Well, you end up here. The 2n factorial simplifies with the 2n factorial here. So you end up with e to the z squared over 2 times tf of phi a squared, which is saying something that is true for every Gaussian process, which is that this quantity, which is a linear average of the phi, is a Gaussian random variable with variance, a centered Gaussian variable with variance this. OK? But this here gets nicely written in terms of the Schringer functions. So if I look at tf of phi a squared, I end up with what? I end up with a double sum, I mean, a sum on x and y of f of x, f of y. And then I get the variance, I mean, the, the, the covariance between phi x and phi y. With this is exactly what I define to be gm discrete xy. OK? OK. Well, again, here, if I renormalize properly, I should end up with something good. So I said there that probably I want, so m I want to be, to, to, that it's equal to a square m star. And then I want to rescale phi by a to the 2 minus d over 2. So I want to make here uh, a to the 2 minus d appear because this will converge. So it gives me a, a to the 2 minus d here. OK. And uh, wh what did I write there? I'm just wondering. Yeah, OK. So I get something like that. And here, if I want this thing to converge, well, I would like this whole thing to converge. And I see a Riemann sum. So probably, I want to be rescaling the tf of phi in such a way that this is going to converge to the corresponding integral. OK, so I have a, a to the 2 minus d here. And in fact, the natural thing that I would like to have here is to have a, a to the d, I mean, to the 2d to get my Riemann sum, right? I have a sum, so I would like uh, over 1 over a to the d uh, points, and I have two of them. So I want to be rescaling this by a to the 2d. So if, instead of looking at tf, I look at the rescale version of it, where, uh, what, where did I define tf here? I, I never defined tf. I defined it only in the continuum, so maybe I uh, I define it still once in uh, in uh, in the discrete. So this is the sum over x of f of x phi x a. But now I'm going to rescale it in order that the variance converges. And here, normally, if I didn't screw things up, which probably I did. I should rescale by a to the d plus 2 over 2. Because if I do that, here it will boil down. So if I put an a, it will boil down to putting an a to the d plus 2 over 2. And here, uh, a to the 2 minus d, sorry, here it's d minus 2. So when I look at this, uh, uh, with the 2, because I'm looking at the square. So a to the d plus 2, uh, a to the d minus 2, I get a to the 2d. And this indeed converges as a tends to 0 to the double integral of f of x, 
f of y times gm continuous xy dx dy. So you see, if I look at this, this average of f, so here, here I screw up things because this is the right uh, scaling. So probably I, I did something wrong there. But uh, the important go home message is that if I rescale like that, which corresponds to rescaling phi x by a to the d plus 2 over 2, then I get a normal random variable of variance this thing, but this variance converges in the limit to a well-defined variance, which would be this thing. Okay. And well, it happens to be that there is indeed a Gaussian a generalized Gaussian process with this variance. It's called the massive Gaussian fifth. So this, this is actually a construction of it. So you call the generalized Gaussian process. Ah, I think I, I understand now where uh, I lost this. Here I lost the plus. Uh, the plus one, I probably lost it from the fact that uh, we have to go from a sum to an integral also in the h. And this is where I lost it. But it's, I hope that it was clear when you look at it with tfa that you need to rescale like that. So you uh, call the generalized Gaussian process that you obtain like that. The massive Gaussian fish. which you abbreviate Gaussian free field by GFF. There are other ways of defining the GFF, more direct ways, directly working on the Hilbert space uh, in a proper fashion. But this is one of the intuitive ways, which is to do the cutoff and to, uh, to end up with a limiting process. Okay? So the go home message on this part was that at least when you are in example one, so when you are Gaussian, when, when, p, uh, when p is quadratic, sorry, you have a way to rescale properly the phi and the m in order to have that the quantities converge and uh, you obtain a limiting process. Okay. Well, the question here is can you do the same when P is not quadratic, and in particular when it has a quartic. Yeah. Uh, and I question the, the convergence of x, s, x, y. It's defined in, in this way, in, in the way that the, the, the exponentials for it is like. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You mean for s2? Yeah, it's pointwise convergence there. We are lucky enough that it's, uh, it, it converges. It's not at all clear that it should exist. So S2 has no reason to exist. That's why I wanted to do this other approach, which is to look directly at the smeared averages, because that is the general thing you want to be considering. Because there you need to be, when you speak of the convergence of a field to another, I mean, of a random distribution to another one, you need to, to mean something. And one thing that you can mean is that the smear averages as random variable converge for every f, okay. which is smooth uh, compact. So the value of s of x, y, a in x and y is s of the nearest <coughs> points of x, y, a. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can make sense of that. But again, it's, yeah, that is uh, from the point of, I mean, it's kind of even an anomaly in some sense that you can make sense of the pointwise uh, estimates, right? I mean, a priori, you are looking at a random distribution, so you really want to be smoothing things out. Yeah, yeah. And probably I should not have done that because there, I mean, I think you agree with me that there, uh, the, the, the proper rescaling for phi is less clear, so I, I screw up things there. I should have done directly with the smear averages. Yeah. Okay, it has been an hour already that you are my victims. Yeah? Um, if you have a mess, uh, yeah. Why can you not uh, take part infinity for d equals two? So you could, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, that makes me think that indeed here it's m star. Huh?
Yeah, yeah, you could. Um, OK, so that's good, because that's exactly the end of uh, the first part, which now I think you understand the game is you want to be taking now a more complicated thing where you have this lambda y to the 4. You are in discrete. You want to take a limit. Can you do it? What do you obtain? Okay. So that's the first story. Now the second part of the story is going to be to forget about that and to look at this type of object here from the point of view of statistical physics. And this I will do in the second uh, half, but we are going to do a, a break because otherwise uh, I, I want to let you the opportunity to fly away and <laughs> never look back. OK, so let's, let's do a yeah, seven, eight minutes break. Let's start again at 10 past, uh, past 3. Let's restart. So first, I found my uh, a squared. Where did he <laughs> leave this? Why it's plus 2 rather than, I mean, uh, rather than minus 2 here is because, I mean, here you are looking at something that is discrete uh, gradient, right? And you want to turn it into a true gradient. So you need to risk it by 1 over a, right? So that's, uh, that's where. But I think uh, everybody would agree that I should just have skipped that <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and worked with this thing. OK, so second point of view, as I said. So we abandon completely this, this uh, question of constructing random distributions. And we look at a model from statistical physics. So 1.2. statistical physics perspective. And there, I'm going to bluntly start with a completely a priori different model. And maybe one of the most famous models of statistical physics, it's called the Ising model. So what's the Ising model? So you take a graph, G, OK? A priori, you take any graph, but really think of uh, a finite piece of the square root of, of uh, ZD or a finite piece of A times ZD. Like typically, you can think of uh, exactly the set I described before. OK? And you define the following. So it's, again, you want to define the average. So now uh, phi, so a configuration. in the easing model. It's an element of plus minus 1 to the vertices of G. So every vertex of G has a variable. And this variable is either plus or minus 1. This variable has the interpretation of what we, we call a spin. It's, I mean, the Ising model is a catastrophically bad uh, uh, model for ferromagnetism. That's why everybody says it's a model for ferromagnetism. But it's a terrible one. Um, and it's named after Ising, who did, I mean, did prove that it was even worse, I mean, than, I mean, that made a, a wrong prediction on the, the model itself. So it's a double uh, bad. Uh, Thing. You should not call it the Ising model and not say it's a ferromagnetic, uh, I mean, it's a model for ferromagnetism. But, well, you know, life isn't fair, so that's how things go. Uh, okay, and the interpretation for ferromagnetism is that if the spin is plus one, then uh, it's kind of, uh, so you have a magnet, the component of this magnet are the, the vertices, the spins at every vertex, and they point either north or south. They act like small magnets. Okay? OK, so once I have that, I tell you what is the measure associated to the Ising model. So the average of a function f 
again, there is going to be this uh, beta parameter. It's going to be 1 over some normalization times the sum for sigma in plus minus 1 to the vertices of g of f of sigma exponential of minus beta edge of sigma, where edge of sigma is minus some jxy sigma x sigma y. So something extremely close to what I got before, except that the spins are valued in plus minus 1. OK? And again, exactly like above, I would say that jxy is 1 if x is neighboring y and 0 is a 1. OK? So it's the nearest neighbor model. So a few remarks on the model. First remark, I already mentioned it. It's a bad model for ferromagnetism. But it's a good model, actually, for all sorts of cooperative phenomena. Why? Because if you think about it, edge, I did, yeah, edge is going to be smaller if there is more spins, neighboring spins at a line. And therefore, the probability or the weight of sigma is going to be larger the smaller disagreements you have. So it's really something that is favoring a agreement, and this is why it's a good thing for, uh, for cooperative phenomena. In particular, it's good for binary alloys, for modeling this type of, of uh, alloys. It's not that bad for ferromagnetism if, in some sense, you assume that the small constituents in your magnet are really only pointing in two directions. That's what is really, really wrong. Normally, it's not the case. And you need to explain how a magnet behaves through quantum physics and not just something uh, semi-classical like, like the Ising model. So that's why it's not such a good model for ferromagnetism. And there is a much better model, which is called the Heisenberg quantum model, uh, which, we, which replaced very early on the Ising model for, for, for uh, ferromagnetism. But it's a very useful model, one of the most famous models of statistical physics. It was introduced by Peirce in 1920. As I said, it was not introduced by Ising. And Ising studied it in his PhD in 1925. And it's one of the most important model uh, exhibiting a phase transition. And that's what I want to be telling you about. OK? So in order to tell you about the phase transition, I need to, com to make the thing a, a little bit more complex. So uh, even if it's a bad model for ferromagnetism, it's actually very practical to uh, think of it that way. So what I'm going to add is I'm going to imagine that sigma is the configuration of my magnet, and I want to put it in a magnetic field, external magnetic field. This magnetic field is going to say point north, so point in the direction plus 1. And this should push each spin to favor being plus 1 rather than minus 1. So I'm going to add here. a term of the, f of, of the following kind, OK? So I end up with a function which now, I mean, a Nising model that depends on beta and on h. And I can look at the magnetization of my magnet, which roughly speaking is going to be 
the average, so I can define, let's say, m g beta h, which is 1 over the okay, number of vertices in g, sum for x in my uh, graph of sigma x. You agree this is kind of the mean uh, average in my, um, the, the mean spin in my uh, magnet. And there is a phase transition in the following fashion, in the following way. So when g tends to, so let's say now you take g a subset of zd is uh, let, I mean, is tending to zd. So if you take a second of graph that is tending to zd, in fact, we, you can prove that this quantity converges to something. So you take larger and larger graph, the mean uh, spin is actually converging to something. This we will actually prove even that this is true because we will prove that as g is in, so if you take g to be say a box, uh, a, a big box, this thing is uh, in fact almost increasing. So it increases to a certain value. OK? That's the first thing. And then what you can do, so this is step one. So this is kind of telling you that you can define the magnetization of an infinite volume magnet. So then the step two is to think, I mean, to look at what happens when you remove the magnetic field. So imagine that you let H tends to 0, OK? Then m of beta h is going to converge to a quantity which is going to depend only on beta. It's called the spontaneous magnetization. So, so this is the magnetization in an external field x, h, sorry. And this is the spontaneous magnetization. And the phase transition is the following, following. Well, this spontaneous magnetization, it's going to be 0 for certain values of beta, and it's going to be strictly positive for other values. So the interpretation is that you have a magnet in an external field. You remove the field. And the question is, does it keep the spontaneous magnetization, or does it lose it? Okay. So in fact, there exists a theorem. There exists a critical value, beta c. And so if d is larger than 1, uh, I mean, larger or equal to 2, there exists a critical value, which belongs to 0 infinity, such that m star of beta is 0 if beta is smaller than beta c, and it's strictly positive if beta is larger than beta c. So, I mean, for people who are used to that, I mean, beta has the interpretation of an inverse temperature, the inverse of a temperature. So if the temperature is too high, the spontaneous magnetization is zero. If it's below a certain critical temperature, then it's strictly positive. So that's kind of what you learn in elementary school. Yeah? Step one, there must be some conditions on D, right? Uh, sorry? Uh, the step one, there must be some conditions. This one here? 
Uh, yeah, if I want to be truly uh, rigorous, I should probably have that the boundary indeed is not too big compared to uh, to the the thing. I mean, it depends what you call by tending, like, but normally it should like include more and more. Okay, let's take to be certain if clearly if you take the box of size n, then it works. Yeah. Okay. So there is a spontaneous magnetization. I mean, there is a phase transition, and the game for statistical physics is this time is not to construct a Euclidean field theory or anything like that. It's to understand what happens through this phase transition, how the things evolve when you let beta go through the phase transition, in particular, what happens when beta is equal to beta c. So this time the game is different. The game is what happens when um, beta is equal to beta c. OK. And we are lucky enough that for the easing model, what happens at beta c is interesting. So there is a first result due to Onzaguer in dimension 2. This is for d equal 2 and to Eisenman, myself, and Sidoravicius in dimension 3 and more, that says that m star at beta c is equal to 0. That means that if you draw m of beta, it's going to look like a continuous function. It's going to be 0 up to the critical temperature, and then it goes. Okay. And this is particularly interesting because at continuous phase transition, physicists predict that at the critical point, the large scale properties of my systems are quite interesting. So what I truly mean by what happens at beta c is, can I study in particular maybe the correlations if I take x1 x2, x3, x2n. Let's say I, I don't want to rescale here. I, I, I take these points. They are fixed. Can I understand what is the limit when I look at larger and larger points that are roughly positioned with respect to each other according to this thing. So what happens when I look at sigma Lx1, sigma Lx2n, as L tends to infinity, and that I look at the critical point? That's typically the type of question that a statistical physicist would like to understand. How the correlation evolves when I look at larger and larger scales. OK. This is important because that helps. I mean, of course, I mean, this is something that sometimes people overlook a little bit, is that, I mean, as a statistical physicist, you want to explain something that uh, is relevant to physics. But for phase transitions that are continuous, I mean, you will never manage in physics to tune an experiment that is exactly at the critical point. At least for this type of systems, it's impossible. So you want to understand, in fact, what happens near the critical point. It's really what you want to be uh, understanding. But there is a miracle of statistical physics that what happens near the critical point is deeply related to what happens exactly at the critical point. And that's why physicists, theoretical physicists and mathematicians study exactly what happens at the critical point. So in particular, for instance, you have what we call scaling relations that enables to compute critical exponents of your system in terms of critical exponent at the critical point. And in particular, how these things behave when L goes to infinity. OK, so that was the second per perspective. It's shorter, but don't worry. We are going to embrace this one, so we are going to only talk about this later. But I wanted to motivate that the question is a priori a little bit different. But clearly, there is a link between the two. 
I think you will agree that it's a pretty direct link, and I want to illustrate it here. So, link between the two approaches. So, 1.3. Okay. First, so there, there are different components. So first link is link between the models. On one side, I have easing. And the other side, I have this phi for lattice models that I define. This thing defined on the lattice where you have. So what's the link between the two models? First, the easing model is in fact a 5-4 mod lattice model in disguise. Why? Because if you want to go like that, remember that this thing had this this, I mean, product of x, I mean, there was this d rho of y, which was e to the minus lambda y to the 4 plus b y squared, right? But if you set b to be equal to 2 lambda, and you notice that you can rescale by a constant your measures, this costs nothing, this is nothing else than constant, I mean, there was a dy, constant e to the minus lambda y squared minus 1 squared dy if you take b to be equal to 2 lambda but now if lambda goes to infinity this is what it's just a measure that is gonna so it's a measure that looks like uh, it's favoring y's that are close to 1 but if lambda goes to infinity then it's actually going to become just the sum the, I mean the average of the two Dirac at plus 1 and minus 1 so b equal 2 lambda tends to infinity, you recover the easing model. Okay? So it's reasonable, so it's not exactly a lattice, uh, 5 4 lattice model because it's a limit when the parameters go to infinity, but really think that nothing degenerates there. It's actually the thing is you, you can make it as a limit of 5 4 lattice model where everything works well and so. So easing is just a subcase somehow of the 5 4 lattice model. But let me mention that actually the story goes both ways. The 5-4 lattice models are actually very closely related to the easing model. In fact, the 5-4 lattice models, they belong to what we call the Griffiths-Simon class of models. And what are these models? There are models for which h of, uh, so let me not call it sigma or phi, let's call it tau. h of tau is minus sum of jxy tau x tau y. So this, both models satisfy this, I mean, easing and phi 4. But the important property of the griffith simon class is that d rho the, the, the measure that is attached to each vertex should have a special structure. Let me try not to screw it up this time. Is that this sh should be written as a sum for sigma bar belonging to plus minus one to the n. So n can be whatever thing. And it should look like exponential of sum over i j equal 1 to n of k i j sigma i sigma j. You are I'm going to tell you what that means exactly. Indicator that tau is equal to sum of q j tau bar j. What does this thing mean? 
It means that you want rho to have a very special structure that looks like that. It looks like rho, I mean, that it looks like tau. E, e, um, sorry, let me do it like that. Imagine I have a graph, okay? Saying that rho has this structure can be interpreted like that. You replace every vertex by a complete graph with n, I mean capital N vertices in it, and you make the vertices interact with coupling constant chi aj, uh, kij, sorry. Uh, that was completely a random pronunciation. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to redo it because I'm going to fail it a second time. Uh, Kij. Okay, so you, you, you look at an easing model, in fact, where you blow up every vertex into n vertices that interact with this k, uh, kij. <laughs> Good. Um, and what you look is that you think that the model you are looking at is actually the model where you forget about the spin of each one of the capital N vertices. You just take this average. For each vertex, you take an average of these guys. Okay? So there is a special case, which is capital N equal 1, where you recover the easing model. Every vertex is just blow up, blow up to one vertex, and tau is sigma x. But now you can imagine that you blow up each vertex to two vertices, and you take the average of the two, for instance. Or capital N vertices, and you take a weird average of the capital N vertices. So the important thing is that when you are looking at a model in the Griffiths-Simon class, uh, by the way, uh, then there is also, I mean, then these guys are interacting actually uh, naturally when you, through the jx, y times, I mean, if you replace tau x by a sum of the qj tau bar j, you end up with an interpretation where each guy interacts with the neighbors. So when you look at the model in the Griffiths-Simon class, just with the tau, you can forget that you look at an easing model. But you can also think, oh, in fact, I'm looking at an easing model on a more complicated graph, and there, everything that I know about the easing model is valid. So, in some sense, if you have a good enough understanding of the easing model, then getting an understanding of the Griffith-Simon class is just, well, being able to extend the result that maybe you prove on ZD, to this weird graph where you blow up every uh, vertex to a complete graph. And in fact, if you are smart enough, not only you will manage to do it for this type of, of models, but also for models that are limits of that. So you could even take, so Griffith Simons is not only these models, so, but also limits of those models, limits as n goes to infinity of those models. Okay? Well, phi 4 belongs to this class. So you need to, you see, you have a little bit of freedom. You can choose a kij, you can choose a qj in a smart fashion. If you do it in a smart fashion, you end up with phi 4 lattice model. So from now on, I'm going to actually focus on easing. But you can trust me that, in fact, the techniques I will describe. They work also in this strange context where I blow up each vertex to complete graphs, and therefore they will work for phi4. So all the theorems I'm going to mention, they work perfectly well for phi4. Okay? So in terms of models, the two perspectives are actually dealing with the same objects. That's the go home, I mean the take home message. Okay? Phi4 is in the limit. Yeah, it's a limit. It's a, you, you get it only uh, in, in the limit, yeah. And in the case of phi 4, the kij is actually be constant, always the same. So actually, every vertex is, uh, is behaving in the same way. And it's a property of, uh, of Curie-Weiss that you get uh, that the, the, the average of the variable is naturally going to have this phi to the 4 that appears in the law, which is ex exactly going to give you the, the phi 4. And q is also constant? Yeah. And q, q is also? Yeah, q will also be constant. So you need to tune them, uh, the order of magnitude. You see, I mean, you want the kij to be quite small, actually, to make a nice average. 
and same thing for QJ, but uh, but you can do it and use it. Okay, so that's the link between the two models. So in fact, we were working with the same models. Second thing now is in both cases, we are taking a limit, right? In one case, we are letting capital R tend to infinity and A tend to zero. In the second case, here we are taking G to infinity, the graph to infinity, and then capital L to infinity, okay? So connection between between the procedure, uh, the, the limiting uh, between the limits. So in constructive Euclidean field theory, we had R go to infinity and a tends to zero, and in statistical physics, where the equivalent here is g tends to zd, and again, I think I agree, I should be more precise that you want to be taking g to be a nice graph. I mean, many things work for arbitrary g, but uh, g, uh, graph, but let's, let's not uh, complicate it, so you can think like lambda n. And here, l goes to infinity. And the clear connection between the two is that you should think of L as one over A here. It's just that in the first process, you rescale the lattice by a factor A. But in fact, when you look at the rescale lattice with the factor A and you look at X1, Xn, they are typically a distance order over one over A of each other. Okay? So here, it's because you are looking at a rescale lattice of mesh size A, and here you are looking at a standard lattice of mesh size 1, but at points that are at distance L of each other, and here at points that are at distance order 1 of each other. OK? OK, that's the second thing I wanted to mention. And the last thing I wanted to mention on the connection between the two is that in Euclidean field theory, you had these three parameters, right? B, lambda, and, uh, and beta. While in statistical physics, it became pretty clear, or I, I actually not even justify, I just went for it, that I wanted to look at what happens at beta c. So how does beta c appear in the story? Why is it that I'm drawing a parallel between the beta c story for statistical physics and the story for Euclidean field theory where a priori there is no parameter? So appearance of beta c. OK, so the reason for that is that the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic easing model, and actually also phi for models, they exhibit what we call a sharp phase transition. So they exhibit a sharp phase transition. So what does it mean? And I'm going to just mention it in the case of easing, but again, exactly because the other, wise, the other one in the, in the Griffith-Simon class, you, you get something similar. So for easing, it means the following. It means that if I look at sigma 0, sigma x at a parameter beta, if beta is smaller than beta c, then this should decay exponentially fast. So this should decay exponentially fast. Minus x of xi of beta. Let's say if I take n times e1, it should behave like that, 1 plus theta law of 1, in fact. So there is a rate of decay, and it decays exponentially fast. But now, if you think of the story of trying to get a limit, I was allowing you to rescale. 
But I mean, if you want something non-trivial, you want that the things do not decay exponentially fast, but polynomially fast. As soon as it decays faster than polynomially fast, in fact, when you are going to go to the limit for people who know what this is, you are going to get uh, just white noise. So in order to get something non-trivial, so in order to get a limit, one wants to work with x smaller than psi of beta, basically. You don't want that, I mean, with, uh, with n smaller than psi of beta. You want to look at a system that has a scale which is smaller than the, what we call the correlation length, this is psi of beta. But if beta is smaller than beta c, just this correlation length is finite, so you cannot rescale things. You cannot let L go to infinity, but also you cannot let A go to zero without starting to exceed by a large amount the correlation length. So in order to have a limit, that means you need the correlation length to go to infinity, so you need beta to tend to beta c. So in fact, every reasonable limit that you will cook up in the constructive Euclidean field theory will necessarily require that you let the parameter beta go to the critical parameter of your system. Of course, you had this b, this lambda that you can change, but basically the beta will have to be close to the beta c of this parameter bn lambda. So that was what I wanted uh, to say, and um, maybe uh, I want still to tell you about the statement uh, at the end of the first class, otherwise I think I will really have absolutely nobody tomorrow. Um, and there is a camera, so I'm, I'm forced to, to, to give the, the second class. <laughs> the total humiliation, like, in front of... <laughs> okay, so the main result. <laughs> Please come tomorrow, <laughs> those who can. <laughs> Maybe the lack of pedagogy in the way I present doesn't show it, but I like you. So <laughs> please come. OK, so uh, 1.4, main result. OK. So the result is going to be exactly dealing with what are the limits we can get for five four lattice models. I'm just going to state it for easing because I hope I convince you that five four is not so different. And actually, I would start next, I mean, tomorrow uh, by giving you a few remarks, in particular telling you that the statement also holds for uh, five four models. And um, the theorem is going to be a description of what happens at criticality. So theorem or near criticality. So it's a result by Michael Eisenman and myself. Maybe it was published last year. And it says the following. So I'm going to define exactly like I did. Uh, again, I'm going to try to use the statistical uh, physics perspective. So you remember we defined the average of f against sigma uh, against phi with a parameter a. So here I'm going to just redefine it with a parameter capital L because I'm in the second interpretation here. But it's really the analog of the TFA of uh, phi that I defined before. So it's going to be sum for x in Zd. So the advantage of statistical uh, physics is that we can already take the limit when uh, the graph goes to infinity. So the R limit is already trivial. I'm going to look at f of x, sigma of x. This is perfectly uh, similar to the other thing. And you remember that we were rescaling at least in the, um, in the example one, which was the on only one that we treated. We rescaled here. Here I'm going to rescale. And in fact, if you think about it, that's the only kind of reasonable order of magnitude you could look at. So I'm going to rescale by one of a sigma square root of sigma l, where sigma l is by definition the sum 
for x and y in the box of size L of sigma x, sigma y, and this is something that depends on beta a priori. So you are going to see at the, I mean, just after I state the theorem, I'm going to make an observation that makes it clear that this is the right rescaling. Okay? Okay, so what does the theorem say? It said, consider the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic easing model. So nearest neighbor ferromagnetic, remember, is jxy equal 1 if you are neighbor and 0 otherwise. On Z4, then there exists a constant such that the following happens. I can take whatever beta small or equal to beta C. I can take whatever L smaller than psi of beta. So psi of beta that I defined here. By the way, here it's a definition, right? I'm telling you there is a psi of beta that satisfies this. It's unique. So I take L smaller than this, and I take F. So here I'm going to take uh, continuous, compactly supported. I mean, of course, this includes the more interesting smooth compactly supported, which would be the natural class. But I mean, you don't even need this. So you take F continuous compactly supported. Then I claim the following. If I look at the characteristic function at beta of TFL of sigma. So I'm trying to see what this guy looks like. And the theorem is going to say it looks like a normal random variable. So what do I mean by that? I mean, well, if I divide it by e to the z squared over 2 times TFL sigma squared, which would be exactly what you would get if it was a normal variable, right? The characteristic function would be equal to this. Because this is, of course, the variance of the variable. Well, it's not exactly a normal random variable. But I can measure how close it is to a normal random variable. And how close it is is that there exists a constant that depends on f and is universal. I mean, that depends only on f, sorry. There is a z to the 4, because you notice that here, I should also say that I should say what z is. So for every z positive, I get this. And here, the important thing, and so because it's important, I'm going to put it in another color. I get log of L to the C. So what this theorem is truly saying and this will be the end of this first class. It says that it says that T F L of sigma is almost like a normal random variable centered of variance where well, the variance it should be, which is the second moment of your variable. Okay? And when I mean almost is that here the approximation is better and better. as L tends to infinity. OK? And in particular, that's what we will see uh, tomorrow. It's, I mean, if you believe this is also true for phi 4, whatever limit you are going to end up with is going to be such that for every average against uh, a smooth function f, you will get a normal random variable. That means you get a Gaussian generalized process, a generalized Gaussian process. And the problem with that is that that means you always end up with something trivial. So it's a no-go theorem from the point of view of trying to construct a Euclidean field theory using 
the five four models. So I will go back to this tomorrow, but I wanted to state the thing properly. And just a second remark, because you could tell me, yeah, no, but you are clearly here, like just that maybe you chose in a poor fashion your, uh, your variance here. I mean, your renormalization here. But notice that this renormalization is such that for f uh, positive, in fact, tfl of sigma squared is between two constants. Why? Because, I mean, if you want, sigma l is what? Is exactly the smeared average against indicator function of the box of size 1 in the sense of the thing. So if you take f, which is a different function, oh, sorry, what did I do here? This, I mean, f doesn't change, right? So I need to f of lx. If I want to be looking at things at scale l, I need to be looking, uh, or, or uh, sorry, the uh, what am I doing? x over l. Right? Yeah, so I, I look at, uh, at, uh, at the average. And I look at scale capital L, and I, I look at the average thing there. And so sigma L is, in some sense, the average here when you take f, which is indicator function of the box of size 1. Because it gives you the sum of everybody in the box of size L. And so when you look at this, it's the variance of this thing. So this is, if you want, this is the average of sum of indicator than uh, x over l belongs to lambda 1 sigma x squared. It's a very complicated way of writing this. Okay? Now, if you don't take indicator function of the box, because this is not a continuous compactly supported thing, but you take anything which is uh, a nice compactly supported function, for instance, if it's 0 outside of the box of size 1 and bounded by uh, 10, then you will get something smaller than 100 by this no renormalization. So this is really the right renormalization. Of course, you can change it by a constant factor, but you will always end up with something that looks like that. OK, uh, I guess that's a good point to stop. Yes? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as soon as f is non-zero, non exactly equal to 0, you're right. And positive, there is a place where it's like really positive and then you will easily see that you um, um, that you get something which is larger than constant okay so that's the CRM tomorrow we I will just make a few comments on the CRM and uh, explain how you do the thing I mean what is the statement for 54 and after that we would have finished the first step of the I mean the first uh, part of the class and we will dive into the toolbox in some sense which is like trying to explain to you what is the object that is going to be uh, powerful for us to actually prove such a result okay okay well see you tomorrow hopefully i will be here at least yes i have a question uh, yes i'm not sure to have uh, correctly und understood uh, the the link between uh, two, uh, the two models Particularly the the Griffith Simon class, this thing. Yes, on this thing taking the uh, on each point uh, taking. Uh, yeah, so so if you think here, so if you look at something like that, that just means that in fact tau is uh, hiding a collection. So tau x is naturally related to uh, sigma bar x i for i equal 1 to n. Why? Because if you look at, uh, let, let me maybe uh, yeah, erase. Can I erase? Let me erase here. Okay. So imagine, so in one case, you have a sum of a tau of e to the minus h of tau times um, a product of uh, 
0 tau. Maybe I should write it like that, even though it's going to be a discrete thing in general. So here, if you write what it is, it's going to be something like a product of sums. And here, it's e to the minus blah, blah. So all this thing here, in fact, is nothing else than exponential of minus sum over x in your graph, sum for i equal 1 to n, sum over x, y, j equal 1 to n of q i q j uh, sigma x i bar sigma y j bar. If you sum, if now you sum over sigmas that are in uh, v of g, I mean plus minus 1 v of g times 1 n. This term is exactly the exponential of minus h of tau. Because this thing is forcing tau to be equal to this sum over sigma. Uh, oh, this is sigma. Uh, and this term is just adding here that you, this was kind of telling you what are the interactions. And there is a jxy here. The interaction between different blobs, different groups. And then you have also the sum over x. This kind of internal interaction here, which is going to give you sum for ij equal 1 to n of kij uh, sigma xi bar sigma xj bar. And here you just see that it's an easing model on vg times 1n with some weird coupling constants, which are uh, between different guys here. It's going to be jxy uh, qi qj, if you look at the uh, interaction between uh, sigma xi and uh, sigma yj. And internal guys are going to be coupling constant kij. Is it a little bit clearer? Okay, good. So I have a question. Yeah. So why do we need this? L is smaller than this capital lines. And what if L is very large? So actually, you don't need. It's just that when L is very large, it's kind of trivial that you get uh, so if L is very large, the correlation in your system decays exponentially fast in constant of, uh, I mean, in, in distance over psi of, of beta. So if you are way above psi of beta, then the correlations are extremely small. So basically, what is it telling you? It's telling you that there is no correlation in your system. So in the limit, you get white noise, meaning that every bit is completely behaving uh, independently. So you don't need, but uh, you, you end up with something that is not, uh, I mean, this is, this is known since a long time. Let's put it that way. Uh, just to, to be yeah. sure, in the statement we take already the infinite icing model? Or is yeah, you take the, the infinite one. You could take a finite one. That would not change uh, the answer. Yeah. You could take the size of your thing here, the graph. You could take it, you size it with L. Of course, I mean, because you need to. And if you size it with L, you will also end up with something uh, where everything is Gaussian. And the constant T, the exponent of the logarithm is like, there exists an exponent. Yeah, yeah, there exists an exponent, and, uh, and it's a small one. And C of F here, I just didn't want to put it, but it's something like norm of F to the power 4 times maybe the range. So, I mean, F is compactly supported, so it must be 0 outside of a box of size. Cap, uh, I mean, small uh, kappa, say. And uh, you, I mean, you get something atrocious, like the range uh, to the power 12 or something like that, which is uh, ridiculous. But you get something extremely explicit in F. There, there is no uh, OK. Well, see you tomorrow.